Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today as we explore ways that together we can help bridge the digital divide. You know, over the past 15 months, we have come to realize that the digital divide is very, very real. You know, early on in the pandemic, one of the stories that really shocked me the most was that the picture of two girls sitting uh, on a sidewalk in the parking lot of Taco Bell so that they could actually go and get their schoolwork done. So this really brought home the fact, even in the middle of Silicon Valley, that the actual digital divide is extremely unreal. Is not only that, but it's absolutely heartbreaking to be in one of the richest countries in the world, one of the most technically affluent valleys in the world, and to be without just basic connectivity. And if it can happen here in Silicon Valley, that means it can really happen everywhere. And we know that that is the case. You know, the level of broadband connectivity available to individuals or households can greatly affect the quality of education, healthcare, and economic opportunities that are received as well as access to critical public services. You know, this is especially true in rural America, home to 60 million Americans, where nearly 20% still lack access to high-speed broadband services. So we're here today to do something about it. We're here to explore ways that together we can connect the unconnected and empower a more inclusive future. So let's go ahead and roll the video. <laughs> It's called the digital divide, a gap between those that have access to the internet and those that don't. And with technology advancing at blinding speeds, so too grows the gap, wider and wider. And in rural America, this gap separates more than 30 million homes and businesses from high-speed broadband service. Here, where I live, my internet has to keep up with me. And for me, it's a lifeline. Fortunately, between those who have and those who don't, there's a bridge built on a network foundation designed to deliver the fastest speeds, the most accurate connectivity, and the promise of 5G. A bridge capable of connecting every sensor, IoT device, and screen, every school and every street, everywhere, every time, and with the speed, bandwidth, reliability, and security deserving of everyone. Bridge, simpler to operate, faster to deploy, able to adapt in real time. To better connect those in need with those who provide, those who make with those who buy, those who teach with those who learn. And one company is at the heart of it all, a company of builders dedicated to a world of connection between one and all. Cisco, the bridge to possible. You know, the challenge of connectivity really comes down to economics. The current economics to extend broadband access to more remote and less densely populated areas are prohibitive. Scaling network capacity to extend broadband services typically requires extensive rack space, power, and cooling to support routing infrastructure. These costs are easier to justify in centralized locations and dense population centers. The business case becomes more challenging as high capacity network access functionality needs to be distributed into more remote locations and closer to those rural communities. In addition to the capital required, operating costs are also growing as network complexity continues to increase. Today, for every single dollar that is spent on CapEx, operations expenses are over five times that cost. However, this one to five ratio limits our customers, our service providers' ability to invest to make more affluent, or densely populated market is generally where those investments go. So we at Cisco's, we're focused on transforming the economics. We're focused on lowering the costs of, of actually moving the bits to build and run the infrastructure and the internet in order to make the internet access available to all. Now we're doing this through our market leading innovations that dramatically help our customers grow more revenue, help them reduce their costs to operate that infrastructure and also to make sure that that infrastructure is, ri is risk free so we can lower the overall risk profile and make sure that it's a secure infrastructure and a trusted infrastructure. So as a global technology company, Cisco is committed to empowering an inclusive future for all 
where everyone can securely access economic, educational, and health opportunities that they need. But doing this successfully will require we bridge the gap between commercial viability and the cost required to serve these rural areas. And so we've invested $20 million to build the Cisco Rural Broadband Innovation Center located in wonderful Raleigh, North Carolina. The center showcases how Cisco can help service providers connect, secure, and automate their networks to deliver essential connectivity with dramatically reduced investment. It provides demonstrations of Cisco technologies that are changing the economics of the internet, making the reliable connectivity more accessible to absolutely everyone. The center was coordinated and funded through the Cisco Country Digital Acceleration Program. This is a unique and agile platform for Cisco investment and co-innovation for critical projects across the entire globe. With over a thousand active or completed projects in over 40 countries impacting 60% of the world's population. The CDA fosters collaborations amongst leaders in government, private, and academia to accelerate national digital agendas and foster innovation across both public and private sectors. It showcases Cisco's mass scale infrastructure solutions that are changing the economics of the internet. They deliver more network capability, capacity, flexibility, and simple operations, all at a dramatically reduced cost, making it easier and less expensive to make reliable connectivity more accessible to everyone and expand broadband access to rural areas. The center highlights the end-to-end -end validated designs across open access architectures, converged software-defined networking transport infrastructure, and subscriber management capabilities. This enables service providers to flexibly expand from their existing access network architectures to accelerate their service deployments and deliver enhanced revenue generating experiences to their customers. This state-of-the-art lab environment covers a wide range of use cases for rural broadband deployment, combining the best of breed elements to deliver multi-access convergence, simplified IP architectures, and cloud native infrastructures that change the economics for delivering broadband services. The solutions showcased in the center simplify the architecture and operations for network infrastructure and redefine capital and operating expenditures completely. At the Innovation Center, you can explore a wide range of rural broadband use cases and the Cisco technology that enable them. You can experience how different solutions work together in a state-of-the-art lab and how to emulate behavior in a real-world network. You can see firsthand how Cisco can help you meet the challenges of rural broadband and change the game for your customers and your business. Some of the solutions include Flexible networking built on Cisco Silicon One, Cisco 8000 series router, which is the pinnacle of routing that a lot of the hyperscale customers, service providers around the world are using to cost effectively ship to higher speeds to support evolving networks. We're also seeing the infrastructure as code that treats network functions as software so you can deploy and change infrastructure more easily, accurately, and less expensively by automating your network operations. We've also seen virtualized and disaggregated network functions that make it simpler, faster, and cheaper to deliver use cases such as residential broadband, business ethernet, fixed wireless access, and so many more. And our new network architecture, Cisco Routed Optical Networking, that lets you converge your optical and IP transport over a common high-capacity routing infrastructure can save providers upwards of almost 50% and dramatically simplify the cost of building out this infrastructure. We've seen intelligent and automated security solutions protect customers and our network initiatives. We've also seen these innovation technologies that are simplifying the network architectures and operations, completely redefining how networks are built today. Now, moving forward, at a lower cost per subscriber, and we're all subscribers in the day, they're on our mobile networks or our fixed networks, Cisco's delivering a whole new generation of network infrastructure technologies for rural America. We're allowing everyone to access the educational, economic, and health opportunities that they need. With that, the Rural Broadband Innovation Center was coordinated funded through CDA, as noted, and this is a unique and agile platform for Cisco Investments. With that, I'm excited to be able to now hand off to Chuck Robbins, our Cisco CEO, to elaborate on Cisco's commitment to powering a more inclusive future for all and discuss how we're bringing our technology together with private, federal, and local initiatives to change the economics of rural broadband in the United States. Chuck, over to you. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, I am excited to be here in North Carolina, particularly to have a conversation on such an important topic. 
I grew up actually in rural Georgia, and I went to high school in Rocky Mount, as did one of our guests today. Uh, but today, it is absolutely inexcusable for our rural communities to not have access. We've been talking about this for years, and it's time that we actually do something about it, uh, particularly with what's happened during the pandemic, and it, it highlighted this gap in a way that we had never seen before. It's critical for so many services we all depend on, education, health care, and it's also clear that no one can solve this alone. It is going to take private sector plus federal, state, local. We have to change how we can bring broadband to all communities, and we must change the economics in order to do that, as Jonathan was talking about earlier. Each of our guests today have a unique perspective on the challenges they're facing in bridging the digital divide and some unique thinking about what we can do to start. So today, I am honored to be joined by FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, joining us via WebEx. Also here in Raleigh with North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. Welcome, Governor. And I'm also excited to see my good friend Carla French, the President and COO of True Vista, a leading provider of communication services here in the southeastern United States. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us. So I am going to orchestrate a conversation, and we're going to test our ability to operate in this new hybrid world that I think we're all going to be operating in as we go forward. And so the first question I wanted to ask is uh, to Commissioner Starks. So, Commissioner, you've been a, uh, I want to thank you for being a strong advocate. You always have been for many years in bridging this digital divide in both rural and urban areas. And given the recent agreement signed between the FCC, NCIA, and the Department of Agriculture, how do you see the FCC leading future efforts to expand broadband for the well-being of all Americans? Yes, well, thank you uh, for inviting me. I deeply believe this is a mission critical conversation and so uh, so honored to be here. You know, the plain and simple fact is that every American should have high quality, affordable broadband, period. And there are tens of millions of Americans without that internet access that are counting on each of us. As you mentioned, uh, whether it's state or federal, in industry, private partnerships, to work together to fight for that more vibrant, inclusive broadband marketplace. And so again, thank you to Cisco for bringing us all together and for the important initiative that you're celebrating here today. You know, to take a, a step back, I really see four pillars in our world that are being driven by connectivity. The first, uh, as, your, as your video mentioned, is that the economy is truly being driven online right now. Millions and millions of small businesses and entities that weren't able to nimbly get uh, their products and services online have been hurt. Uh, but truly, our economy is being powered by online services right now. Second, uh, you know, what was previously understood as the homework gap, namely students that weren't able to access their homework uh, outside the classroom, that has morphed into a true learning gap for those students that are unable to get virtually connected. The third real pillar that I would talk about for connectivity right now is telehealth and telemedicine. That has made leaps and bounds during the pandemic. The ability to access your medical appointments that you need virtually is not going away. And then finally, you know, I would say so many of these personal connections from birthday parties to bar mitzvahs to weddings have all been virtual and it's hard to stay connected with those loved ones without getting connected. And so, by the way, many of our essential government services and functions have moved online as well, from the ability to apply for unemployment assistance uh, to registering to vote. Of course, I note both accessible online there in North Carolina. So those are big stakes. And here's what the FCC can do briefly. First is access. I don't, of course, need to tell this panel that there are still mi millions of Americans, over 600,000 of them there that are North Carolinians uh, who live in areas typically rural, less densely populated that don't have service. And so the Universal Service Fund is focusing on that there at the FCC. Second is affordability. The coronavirus has caused economic upheaval for millions of Americans, struggling Americans. And so making broadband affordable has never been more important. There's the emergency broadband benefit, a $3.2 billion program administered by the FCC, paying to get low-income families connected. We have more than 100,000 North Carolina households signed up, but we need many more to get connected that are eligible. So we've got to keep on pushing. 
And so the last thing that I'll mention here, the FCC needs to do and continue to accelerate here is empowering all Americans to take advantage uh, uh, by making sure they have the right digital skills. That's with libraries and schools, uh, the FCC's E-Rate program. But the point is in particular for our seniors, making sure that they know how to safely get connected, get online. And uh, I deeply applaud Governor Cooper for making digital skills and in particular digital equity a central part of his program uh, is something that uh, I think we all need to continue to coordinate and collaborate on. Well, Commissioner Starks, thank you. I, I think that uh, your comments resonated with me in particular. The, I think the, the pandemic has obviously been incredibly tragic, but I think it has highlighted, A, the need for us to make this happen with a greater sense of urgency than we've ever had before. But it also showed us a few important lessons that I think can help us in the future. It, it, it led us to believe that with the right technology, with the right bandwidth, it may not be optimal, but we can deliver education into the home. And we also can deliver healthcare services into the home, which particularly in the United States, I don't think doctors nor patients were big fans of, of remote healthcare before the pandemic. But then the other thing I think that it really showed us is we can now hire people where they are. The pandemic proved to us that people can work in certain jobs anywhere. And so as we think about the, the, the overarching inequality issue that we're trying to deal with, I think the, the good news is during the pandemic, we learned about a lot of capabilities that should help us come out and uh, actually solve some of this as we go to, to the future. So Governor, thanks for being with us. It's good to see you. And good to see you as well, Chuck. You know, Jonathan mentioned it. Cisco, back in 2019, we refreshed our corporate purpose. And we said that our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. And it's something that I know uh, it's a sentiment that you and I have talked about, and we certainly share that, particularly for the North Carolinians, and given how long my, my history in North Carolina as well. And uh, you've always stressed the importance of broadband across, access to all the North Carolinians. Uh, one of your key initiatives has been this great program where you're trying to bring local leaders together with private sector to focus on education, health care, as well as economic development. Where do you want the state to take this from here? What role do you want to play and how do you see this evolving? Well, Chuck, we're excited to have you here in North Carolina where you belong. <laughs> Fellow Tar Heel, both of us, glad, glad to have you here. And we're grateful for Cisco's strong presence in our state and what you're doing nationally with this rural broadband center. We're, we're excited to have you here. We've got over a million North Carolinians who are on the wrong side of the digital divide and you try to find good things when bad things happen. And the good thing that you mentioned out of this pandemic is that it has pushed us ahead maybe 10 years in knowing that we have to address this digital divide. It's particularly acute in black communities, in our Latinx community, in our Native American communities, which rank lower. So it is why I've created the office, the Digital Office of Equity and Literacy to focus on that, Hope County, one of our most rural counties, Dr. Karen Smith had already been experimenting with opioid abuse treatment online with her patients. Well, when the pandemic came, a lot of her patients did not want to come into the office. Mm -hmm. So she decided to expand that to really work on telemedicine. Well, in Hope County, a lot of people were not connected. She was innovative. She put a hot spot in her parking lot and had people drive up and they conducted telemedicine appointments like that. But it showed us how important it is to make sure that all households have real connectivity. And one thing we have to remember, we've got to have the infrastructure and thanks to Cisco for helping that be more cost effective, but we know we're going to have to invest significantly. But we also have to remember that even if you've got the fiber by your home or the tower next door, if you can't afford to subscribe, mm -hmm. then you're not connected. If you don't have a device, you're not connected. And if you don't know how to use it, you're not connected. So we've got to make a comprehensive <coughs> investment to make sure we close the digital divide in North Carolina and across the country. That is so true, and we have we have someone with us today who is going to be responsible for actually that all that execution in these rural areas. So, Carla French, so great to see you again. Uh, we have known each other for a long time, 
and uh, <laughs> I really love it. If you could share with us some of the challenges you face and, and as you think about the opportunity that we're discussing here today, the role of government funding and helping you build out your network to expand broadband access in these rural areas, that'd be great. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me and including us in the conversation. You know, first of all, let me just say we're so grateful to the government funding that's becoming available. Everybody is trying to do the right thing. And there are many entities that are participating. They've all got different guidelines and, and different requirements to, to participate in. But, you know, at a high level, everybody wants to do the right thing. Everybody wants to try to make sure that as, as rural citizens, we get as many connected as we possibly can in the near term and as soon as possible. I'm from a rural community as well. I chose to work for a company that serves rural communities because I felt like it was important. And Cisco and I had this conversation before COVID in the fact that we knew how important rural communities were gonna be from a broadband perspective in the future. COVID just accelerated all of that, right? And so um, government entities today are working very hard to provide services and offerings that um, are meaningful to, at the end of the day, the end users. Um, we've had success in working with the, a variety of government programs around funding, and but as you continue to, to deploy and execute on those funding opportunities, we all learn things, right? And so the opportunity to continue to improve those funding mechanisms, the opportunity to work together and, and simplify processes and, and guidelines um, is also there, you know, and I think we're at a point now where, for example, the FCC, the NTIA program has probably learned from previous programs. And so it is a, you know, it's, it's modified and it's a little easier and, it, and it's very accommodating. Um, you, look, you look with, uh, with different gov state government entities you know, some of them are very accommodating, North Carolina being one and, and others are very accommodating in taking uh, federal funds and rolling that in to make programs a lot easier. But then there are some states that are, are challenged with um, internal organizations that do things that are kind of dichotomous to each other. So I think as we continue to learn and, um, and deploy on these grants and funding that is available, then I think we'll all get better at it. But um, I look forward to, you know, just really being able to maximize the opportunities that are out there. And, and for us, our challenges are um, staying, staying current with all the opportunities <laughs> that are there, meeting the file, filing deadlines, uh, making sure that we've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed, and, and I know that the uh, that the center there in North Carolina will be helpful to that. C Cisco's done a great job of trying to consolidate and help educate providers like ourselves in in overcoming those hurdles. So, um, from a government perspective, the the eye is on the prize. You know, now we just continue to grow and evolve and make sure that we take all the right steps to deploy as quickly as possible and ensure that we're reaching as many folks as we can. Education of the consumer, Commissioner Starks talked about the uh, emergency, emergency broadband program. Education of the consumer is critical. And I, I don't know the answers to that. We're all trying our own way um, because we've, we've reached out to tens of thousands of what we believe are qualified candidates for the EBBP program to get no answers back. So, you know, we all we all have to learn how to um, reach those, those underserved communities that have the benefit of some of these programs that they're not aware of yet. Right. And then how do we deliver broadband to them as quickly as possible? Thank you, Carla. That's awesome. Uh, Commissioner Starks, I wanna come back to you on another very important topic, uh, security. The security of our networks mm -hmm. is critical. And this is an area where you've been actively engaged at the commission uh, recent FCC announcement on rip and replace funding, as well as uh, holding an ORAN showcase just last week. What do you think is working to ensure our, our legacy networks remain secure while also keeping an eye on future technology in this particular area? Well, I got to tell you, Chuck, you are up to speed on uh, on everything that we're doing here. I, I could not agree more. You know, my my um, my headline here has been that network security is national security. And so if our networks are not secure, 
they cannot provide that reliable, high quality connectivity uh, that everybody relies on them for and that everybody deserves. And so we know that historically, some U.S. networks, uh, in particular, uh, you know, apropos of today, in particular, some small rural carriers uh, in a lot of rural areas were using untrustworthy equipment uh, made by Chinese vendors and oh. that there was and uh, rightfully so widespread bipartisan agreement that we needed to remove that equipment as a national security imperative. And so a number of years ago, you know, I founded and started a workshop where I called Find It, Fix It, Fund It to make sure that we were finding that insecure uh, equipment, uh, replacing it, and then finding a way, of course, to make sure that uh, those small rural carriers that sometimes are operating on, on a shoestring were able to get reimbursed um, uh, for that. And so just last week, the commission did mark a significant milestone in our work in eliminating that untrustworthy equipment yeah. from those American communication networks and establishing a framework for reimbursing you know, affected carriers who need to remove it nearly almost $1.9 billion in funding. I've long said that I think ORAN and being able to um, decouple the stack is going to be an important initiative that's going to make sure that is where the future um, of American technology is going. I think that's the way that's going to help make sure that we can continue uh, to secure our networks. And all of this is very good news, very good, uh, important initiatives. One thing that I would tack on to what Carla was talking about on her previous answer, um, you know, as a government, uh, a new government program, the emergency broadband benefit, I, I always want to take opportunities like the, the great event that we're all at here today to make sure that for folks that need more information on EBB, uh, we do know that there are many more North Carolinians as well as Americans everywhere uh, who are, are eligible for that program. It's going to be deeply important that we make sure that they know about it and get them signed up. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. I agree completely. It's uh, it is it's really important. We thank thank you for your leadership in the uh, security area as well. So, Governor Cooper, National Governors Association. This has been a hot topic, I think, for you all around this rural broadband connectivity. What what advice or do you have for your peers, or what what can we do within that organization to help make sure we're driving consistency and getting this done? Well, there's a lot of ways you, you can look at how a state's successful. I think we rank about 11th or so in access. Uh, my message to them is that we're going to be a top five state, state so look out because we're coming. <laughs> but, I, but I think commitment to funding is going to be critical because now is our chance. Yeah. We have never had the availability of the resources that we have now. There's infrastructure legislation that's being debated right now in Congress that specifically funds uh, broadband access. Mm -hmm. However, we're already going to use American Rescue Plan funds. We've already recommended, I've recommended to the legislature, 1.2 billion of that to go ahead and begin this process because we know it's going to be significant and it's going to require a real investment. Mm -hmm. Also mentioning about help with subscriptions. We got to remember how important that right. is. One of the things I've done is put pressure on internet service providers to contact their customers to let them know they may be eligible for this subscription assistance because a lot of them may not know about it. Mm -hmm. And so I've written them letters and told them that they need to be a part of this solution. So I would advocate other states do that as well to, to make sure customers know that this program is available for them to help get them online. Yeah, that's great. That's a great idea to go ahead and start forward funding. You know it's coming. It's coming. You know it's coming. Got to do it. Uh, Carla, back to you real quick. So you've created a public-private partnership working with Kershaw County, I believe, to help you reach uh, an underserved area. What advice can you give to others about how do you use these public-private partnerships to really bridge the uh, digital divide? You know, um, there, are, there are very complicated things you can do, and then there are very simple things that you can do. <laughs> and, and simply put, you know, reaching out to the appropriate leadership and having good dialogue and good conversation um, allowed us to forge a bond that said together we're going to go invest and we're going to go after these underserved communities or the underserved uh, residences, residents of Kershaw County. And so we met several times and those community leaders then went out and took it upon themselves to go meet other community leaders. They took our message, we coached them on how to have the conversation and they went out and started having the conversation. 
um, understanding who those major influencers are when you're going into a community is critical. And so we were very successful doing that. And then from, from our perspective, we were as transparent as we could possibly be on what it was going to take to get it done and make sure that everybody understood that, you know, a lot of people think it's flip a switch and you've got internet access. So we wanted to make sure that everybody understood the timelines, the costs associated with it, the, the barriers to being successful. You know, we had some, we had some federal land that we were having to negotiate and, you know, make sure that we didn't disrupt disrupts species inside there you know all of these kinds of things when you get out into to rural america that can be uh, roadblocks but working together um we were able to to we are at the at the very tail end stages of completing a project about two years at least two years early and we'll get to just under 2,000 subscribers and provide um high-speed broadband fiber up to a gig symmetrical to those to those folks. Now the challenge will be those folks that are not within that build out, you know, how do we get to them next? And so those are the conversations we're having now. And, and in some cases, specifically with those residents that want to know why they didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, I suspect so that's, that, the, that's the kind of problem you want. I suspect that those little community functions and community parties, there's uh, people talking about how this, they got this new fast bandwidth and they're like, wait a minute, I didn't get that. So anyway. Um, well, and the other, one, one thing I will say that's a byproduct of this already, a new um, turkey facility is coming into that rural footprint. Could not have probably happened without, without yeah. high-speed broadband. That's fantastic. So that's uh, it's an economic opportunity there for the community as well. Okay, as we close here, we're going to do a little bit of a mini lightning round. So we've, uh, we've talked about a, a lot of challenges, and there's a huge opportunity ahead of us that we're all committed to and we're all excited about, we're deeply passionate about. So the last question is, for each of you, what, what are the one or two things that we, and when I say we, us working together, the industry, Cisco, whatever, what do you think the one or two critical things that we truly need to do, get right to move the needle uh, on this going forward? And Carla, I'm gonna start with you. At a high level, I would love to see government agencies work together to be more cohesive in, in funding deployment and how, how that happens and getting to the service providers. The other piece too is uh, develop relationships with the service providers and offer some flexibility around designing solutions for those rural areas versus being defined on the front end. So that allows us to get to those extra 10, that allows us to get to you know a, a street down off, off a way that may have been missed in the, the de early definitions of, of a program. You know, Carl, that's such great advice because when I go to DC, I have lots of lawmakers telling me the technology that we have to use to get into these rural areas. And I actually, I actually think you may have a better perspective on that than some of those folks do. Uh, let's, uh, they're doing it from, with the best intention. So Commissioner Stark. Absolutely. One or two from you, please. Yeah, you know, I think the, the from my perspective, uh, in my aperture, I have seen, especially over the course of the pandemic, uh, so many households that are struggling uh, and so I do think even with regard to uh, with broadband, uh, making sure that it is a whole of government, you do see a bipartisan push now of folks that recognize that there are unserved areas, but there are also pockets of urban folks that have affordability issues. Over 30 million households simply cannot afford connectivity. Uh, and that includes a number of low income folks that live in rural areas. So solving for some of those problems is gonna be important. Mm but also just the fact of over the course of the pandemic, we have seen uh, just a, a hockey stick uh, of folks that are applying for SNAP because they're having food insecurity. But the fact of the matter is if you are having food insecurity in your household, I bet you are having digital insecurity as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so making sure that those households, if they are knocking on the door to get assistance for SNAP and for food, that we also let them know about an emergency broadband benefit or a low income program that's going to also help them get connected uh, because we don't want them to have to knock on each door, especially for those struggling households. Well, it's a, it's a great point because as I recall, when, when E-rate was created, it was tied to the percentage of students getting free lunch, which was a proxy for the economic prosperity of a given, of a given yes, area. Sir. And it is important to remember those inner city communities where it's not about access to broadband, it's about paying for and having the right technology. Governor. 
posting us. Thank you for being here. One or two things you think we really need to focus on. A comprehensive problem requires a comprehensive solution. And when you're talking about equity being involved in everything that we do, it's critical. And government's going to have to face up to the fact that this has got to be a public-private <coughs> partnership to get this done mm -hmm. right now. We've got to make the investment right now. Yeah. And I'm excited about the future because this is our moment. It really, it really is. And uh, I just want to thank all of you on this incredible panel, not only for joining us, but uh, for all that you're doing on behalf of our communities and candidly the country to try to make it easier for everyone to take part in, in our increasingly digital world and really create opportunity for everyone to participate in this, uh, you know, the, the growth economy. I'm optimistic that we can solve this together, but I also know there's a lot of hard work. There's an awful lot of uh, complexity, but I think that it, the time is now, and I want to thank all of you for your commitment. I want to thank our audience for tuning in. Uh, I think because you're here today, it also shows your commitment to this important issue. And on behalf of Cisco, I just want to say that we're excited to work with many of you to drive a more inclusive future for everyone. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to our panelists. My name is Casey Shemansky, and I am a content editor for our talent brand team. In 2004, uh, my younger sister Kelly passed away unexpectedly. Obviously, it was a very difficult time for me and my, and my family, but we came together. We realized we wanted to give back. I think what makes me want to take action is, is a big part of, of my upbringing. I think a lot of that comes from being a first responder family, and when others are running out to safety, my family was always running in. In 2011, St. Baldrick's found me. The St. Baldrick's Foundation started with a